Hi kids, welcome to On The Marquee. This is a podcast where we dive deep into films. Uh, once we have fully penetrated the flesh of the film, we use that as an opportunity to stab around for a topic for discussion. Using that uh, language because today we're going to be talking about Scream and horror movies and horror fandom. So I have some guests with me here today, and I have uh, uh, on the marquee mainstay. So let's get to that old face first. Uh, the dirty <laughs> hippie himself, Michael Cast. Hi, Michael. Hey, I I was I was really impressed with the language that you used in the opening. Oh yeah, I know. I was like, oh, let's see what he's doing there. So yeah, I saw that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so. We've done an episode, Michael, on The Shining, and you watched The Shining. You liked The Shining? I've seen The Shining. It's okay. Yeah. Okay. And then we did Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Didn't watch it. And you did not watch it. And now we're doing Scream, and you did not watch it. I want. I watched a recap out of respect for you. Thanks. And <laughs> in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre episode, you said you are not a horror fan. No. But you also, in that, said that you liked Poltergeist. Well, I like I like Poltergeist. It doesn't make me. I mean, so you don't not like horror. You're just not a horror fan. I guess so. Okay, so that if we're talking about Scream, uh, the question is, what's your favorite scary movie? Poltergeist. <laughs> is it? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, uh, all right. Yeah. Well, I'm sure there's others, but that's the one that comes to mind for me. Yeah. All right. Uh, okay, and then let's get to our guests. I have the Gundersons here, uh, Kelly and Kevin. Uh, we've been talking for about a month. I proposed you guys coming on. Uh, you were busy, Kelly. You were away in Calgary? Yes, I was doing the tattoo convention in Calgary for Dark Art. Okay, what is Dark Art? Dark Art is my art where I take taxidermy <laughs> and put my spin on it. And you've been doing that for how long? Eight years. And how did you get, so how do you get into taxidermy? I did a three-year apprenticeship for traditional taxidermy. So I can taxidermy like traditional bears, head mounts, which I did for the first three years. And then after I did my tag, uh, my apprenticeship, um, I did my own kind of Frankenstein-y of taxidermy. <laughs> Yes, I, I was. I uh, saw all the little ducks. Where yeah. do you get ducks to taxidermy? Those ducklings come from farms that don't make it. Nothing gets killed for my art. <laughs> I don't wear a safari hat and go to <laughs> people's yards and take ducks. <laughs> I suffer. <from> that. <laughs> so you do that at tattoo conventions uh, is there anywhere else where um, I used to do a, like a lot of the small fairs around town yep but I mainly just do uh, the tattoo shows I have done horror con in Calgary too um, pretty much I do like little shows here and there but mainly tattoo so what would you say is sort of the the percentage or the overlap between like a tattoo show and popular con like is it the same general audience or is there is it varied mm, it's very yeah uh for horror con it's very niche so i do a little bit more like theme like i did a pennywise rat i've done oh what's the other ones uh john wayne gacy rat for horror con that one was good so many a lot of people did not get the reference to that which i was very disappointed <laughs> All right, and then Kevin, you are not a horror fan. No. No, so we were talking and you were uh, not a fan of jump scares, it seemed. I don't like that you know the formula <laughs> and that you know what's going to happen and there's nothing you can do to prevent it. But you... watching a movie with them? It's <laughs> <laughs> Very limited audience on that. You don't watch the movie, you watch it and watch the movie. Yeah, no, jump scare is not a fun thing for me. Shining, that's classic, that's called classic, that's a good one. But if I have a choice and I sit down to watch a movie, I want to watch something I can zone out to. <laughs> that's all right. All right, so we'll start with uh, 
Scream. Uh, so if we're going to start with Scream, we have to talk about a different Kevin. Uh, Kevin Williamson is the writer of Scream. Uh, Kevin Williamson got the idea when he was house sitting and he was watching a program. Uh, it was called Turning Point. Uh, ABC News. Uh, it was hosted by Barbara Walters and they were Turning Point. They were talking about the Gainesville Ripper. Uh, are you a fan of, um, what am I trying to say? True crime? True crime, yeah. Big fan. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. To say the least. Yeah, to say the least, yeah. <laughs> and I'm guessing Kevin, not so much. He pretty well, much gets forced when I watch it. <laughs> there's a difference in that. When you're watching documentaries or you're watching, like, uh, the stories of things that have happened and getting to understand that, that's not really a kind of horror style thing to it but you can't so, yeah. jump scared in a true I, st crime. I don't turn it on myself okay <laughs> michael are you a fan of true crime is that something you're not interested in or uh <clears throat> it's like a 50 50 thing yeah i'm more I, yeah it's it's like a um, i love documentaries right so if it happens to be about a crime that you know, then it's, and it sort of piques my curiosity and then I'll watch it. But, but I don't go, I don't look for it, right? Like I don't go seeking true crime stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I could say I've, I've never listened to a true crime podcast, but I've definitely watched true crime. Do you have Kelly, like a favorite true crime series, documentary, podcast, anything like uh, that? I listen to Canadian true crime okay. on a podcast. It's really good. It's all about Canadian serial killers and killers all over Canada. Um, and then pretty much anything that's on TV, I'm watching it. Yeah. Then, but yeah, no, no, I didn't do any of that. <laughs> if she happens to tell me about it or if I'm sitting on the couch with her, that's about the only time I watch them. The interesting Is in some of them. like a comfort watch thing? Because... Uh, I just dropped, jumped to my mind. Uh, we watched, uh, my wife and I watched I'll Be Grown in the Dark. And that was something that I was surprised that she wanted to rewatch. She's like, what? let's watch that one again. What was it called? Have you seen I'll Be Gone in the Dark? I don't think so. What is it on? It's on Crave. I think it might be an HBO thing. It's um, about, uh, what is his name? The... Um, he had a couple different names. Killer in California. That uh, that sadly does not. Yeah, it does work. not narrow that <laughs> down. <laughs> uh, he was active during the seventies. Anyway, Zodiac. No, not the Zodiac. No, no that no, was they, way they, back. They, they caught him finally, like just a couple years ago, using oh, DNA. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, oh. It's really bothering me. The start with a G. Maybe I will, uh, Maybe you Let's just utilize the internet. Because there was the ice pick killer that was in California in the 80s as well. Same thing with Reg Reg uh, Richard Reg Rodriguez. 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 <laughs> um, but he, those ones have been caught. Yeah, he was finally caught, like, I think, the Golden State Killer. Yeah. Oh. Hmm. But yeah it did was, start with a G. It did start with a G. <laughs> yeah. He was lucky. He was Rape case. and or murder women break into their houses during the start of his spree he was working for a police department was fired when they caught him stealing uh from a hardware store stuff that he would use to break in that they never put two and two together but uh yeah so let's get to a, so you have you haven't heard of the Gainesville Ripper then yes I have you have yes okay yeah so Gainesville Ripper um was a guy who, yes, uh, he, he's he got a sob story, upbringing. Uh, his father was a Vietnam War vet, abused him and his, his mother. Uh, before he goes to Gainesville, he murders uh, a man and his daughter and his son. He shoots his father, leaves for Gainesville, ends up camp, uh, camping out behind the uni University of Florida, and he uh, rapes and murders uh, some women. Uh, there's one male victim. Anyways, 
This is what Kevin Williamson was watching while he was house sitting in a stranger's house. Uh, and then he noticed that there was a window open that he did not remember being open. So he did uh, what I think is a smart thing is he grabbed his phone and he called a friend and he grabbed a knife and he went around the house to investigate. That way he's got a knife to defend himself. If anything happens, he's already on the phone with someone. Uh, nothing happened. There was nobody in the house. But during the conversation with his friend, they started talking about horror movies and what you would actually do if you were in a horror movie. And thus, he got the idea for Scream. Uh, went away uh, in a hotel room, spent three days writing the screenplay, and then gave it to his agent. And a bidding war started for the script for Scream. Um, studios were bidding on it. The price kept going up and up and up. And eventually, studios would drop out because, A, it's a horror movie. So studios don't want to pay too much for horror. And B, uh, it's from a writer who has not yet had a produced screenplay. So it came down to uh, two production companies, one of them owned by Oliver Stone, and the other one was Dimension Films, which was owned by Miramax. Uh, the executive that uh, read the screenplay for Scream um, called Kevin Williamson and he told him, listen, Somebody else will give you more money for your, your script. We will actually make it. So if you want it actually made, sign with us. If you want the money, go ahead, go with them. Which is a smart thing because Kevin Williamson had sold a screenplay before, but it had been shelved, stuck in development hell. Uh, wouldn't get made until 1999 when Williamson had the power to make it himself. Miramax buys it for him. Uh, that, at the time, was titled Killing Mrs. Tingle, but by the time he made it, it's post-Columbine, where school shootings were uh, had an impact. So it title has changed to Teaching Mrs. Tingle. Have you seen Teaching Mrs. Yes. Tingle? You would have seen Teaching Mrs. Tingle. <laughs> it's, 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 not, uh, it's, not it's not Scream. No. No. Well, I've seen Scream, too. It, that was a classic back in the day, but... Yeah. So anyways, uh, yeah, so Dimension Films, which is owned by Miramax, uh, by Scream, and then they go about trying to find a director for it. Uh, Miramax first attempts to use the directors that they have in their stable that they made their names off of. Uh, three directors kind of from the same cloth, uh, both reference pop culture a lot. So kind of fits with Scream. Any idea who those three are? Not a clue. Not a clue. <laughs> uh, there's one director who is mostly known just for his dialogue. There's another who is mostly known for his visuals. And there's one who is known for both things. Uh, the first one, Kevin Smith. Nice. You guys, you went to the, the road show, right? I have Kevin Smith's autograph. We both so have it I tattooed on us. <laughs> yeah, and that one. Yeah, I don't think uh, Kevin Smith would have been the good choice for Scream. Yeah. But he's made some horror, but definitely not horror like not like Scream. Scream. Yeah, Tusk is a little different. Yes, a very, very, <laughs> very different. Uh, and then the other director is Robert Rodriguez. And then the last one is Quentin Tarantino. Uh, which, I don't know, maybe it would work, but I still don't think it'd be quite the fit. It'd be a bit different if T uh, Tarantino doing that for yeah. sure. Yeah. So Tarantino and Rodriguez end up making um, From Dust Till Dawn instead of making Scream. And then eventually uh, we've got, they approached people like Sam Raimi and George A. Romero. Romero was in a dry spell, wasn't really making anything. I think Raimi is in between making The Quick and the Dead and uh, Simple Plan. Have you seen either of those, Kevin? Quick and the Dead for sure. Simple Plan, I think so. I just can't remember it. Simple Plan is uh, it's kind of like a, a quieter Coen Brothers type film almost. It's that uh, they find, uh, I think it's a downed plane full of money. 
and they find the money and then it's yeah it's not ringing enough bells to <laughs> yeah. to keep going down that road but anyway so eventually we get west craven signs on craven signs on uh mostly just because his uh his assistant keeps telling him you should do this one what about this one what about this one and he's interested because at the time the only person signed on to the film is uh drew barry Drew Barrymore was initially supposed to be the lead. She was supposed to play Sydney. She changed her mind six weeks before filming and decided that she wanted to be the girl in the opening. That's why her face is on the post. Yes, and they definitely lean into that heavy in the marketing, which um, gives it that psycho factor, right? She, you think she's the star. Now she's dead anything and you still have a movie to go through <laughs> yeah exactly nobody's safe now um so i will admit i'm completely biased because scream is my favorite horror movie i don't think it's the scariest movie but it's my favorite horror movie um do you have, here's a question kelly do horror movies scare you not is it for a very long time? Not for a very long time? No. Do you still occasionally get one that does, or is it? Um, not really scary, but I think the last one that kind of like messed with my mind was Hereditary. Yes. Because it's not really like a scary one. It was more like, what? What the? What did I just watch? <laughs> I remember watching Hereditary in the theater and like experiencing things I don't feel like I'd ever, like, I felt doom. Like, the doom was pressing down on me, and I was like, what is happening? And I think because of the time that it came out and that I had a kid at home, there was definitely parts of the movie where I'm like, nope, that's it. I I might just get out and walk out. <laughs> I've never walked out of a movie before, but I might just do it right now. Uh, I'm glad I didn't, though, but I like it. Um, my wife liked it until the ending uh, she hates the ending she thinks it's really 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 dumb she gets really mad about it because she loved it up until that point michael you have not seen hereditary no nope. no nope. so we uh, when you when when my wife and i are watching something it's like when we're deciding on watching something it's like well, that's a horror no it just <laughs> we just skip through it. <laughs> just it. yeah yeah no, if I want to watch something with her, the easiest way to get her to actually pay attention and watch it is either to watch something horror or to watch something comedy. If it's not either of those things, she usually will not pay attention to what is on the screen. <laughs> yeah, so do you, when you watch horror, you watch with Gage usually or alone? Usually alone. <laughs> But even though, like, Gage and Samara both watch movies with me, they've grown up on it. Right. But other than that, I usually watch them alone. Do you remember the first time you watched Scream? Was it when it came out or was it later? Yeah, it was definitely when it first came out. Were you a horror fan by then? Oh, yeah. I've been a horror fan since I was, like, five. So how how does that start? Like, how do you become, what's the uh, the origin story of Kelly the horror fan? My uncle. Your uncle? So I would go for weekend trips and do sleepovers at his house. We'd get candy, junk food. And he's like, don't tell your parents that I'm letting you watch this. <laughs> and we would literally watch Tales from the Crypt, the old 80s Freddy, like all the classics, all the Jasons, everything, Mike Myers. And that was literally the staple on where I am now. So... Uh, I meant to ask earlier, who or what is Betty Kruger? Who or what? So it's a mixture of two. So where I got the name? Sure. Okay. Where I got the name is a mixture of, um, <sighs> my brain just went, but that's all right. Betty Page. Betty Page. Oh, there we go. It's a mixture of Betty Page and Freddy Krueger. Because I remember when I was younger watching Freddy Krueger, I was like, okay, I don't really find this scary, more cheesy than scary, but that's kind of like a lot of my routines. It's very gory, 
but yet kind of cheesy where you're just like, should I be turned on by watching this? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, Freddie definitely goes through, and that's part of the reason that Wes Craven makes Scream uh, and his response to horror is, right, Freddie starts in one place and then as the franchise goes on, he gets uh, more jokey, um, more of, right, because in the, the 80s, the the slasher, the the characters of the series, the franchise, become the stars, right? Your Freddies, your Jasons, your Michael Myers are the star. That's what you build the franchise around, right? But as they go, I feel like they get farther and farther away from the origins, which is what Scream was trying to respond to anyways. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have a favorite horror franchise? Um, I kind of have a mixture. Like, I love the B-grade horror movies. Like, you can't go wrong with those. (laughs) But I also like horror that pushes boundaries. Like, I remember watching movies back in the day, and it would be like, children were safe, for the most part, besides, like, Pet Cemetery. Um, and animals. So whenever anyone pushed those boundaries, like whether killing off kids or animals in movies or just pushing that limits, I'm like, okay, this is fucked up, but I like it because they're literally pushing the limits. And if I can't predict where the movie's going, then I love it. Even if Kevin knows the formula, he does not. (laughs) Even if I'm in another room watching a completely different, more happier movie. (laughs) Yeah, so I think, um, well, let's talk about poor movie phantom franchise for a bit. Because I think what happens uh, with Halloween, right? Halloween helps kick off the slashers, 78. Mm Mm-hmm. And it's uh, this big success, this hit that nobody saw coming. So much so that when they make Halloween 2, they have to go in and do reshoots to add more gore to the kills because it's no longer up to the standard of everybody else who came in and copied them. Um, But I think you have, in the 70s, we talked about this a bit in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre episode, that in the 70s, the horror that was being made by the major studios was the um, the supernatural horror, right? All the biggest franchises were The Exorcist. Um, what are guys? The Omen. Yeah, so it was these other things. There wasn't the slasher that were big, and there wasn't as much horror being made in the 70s. More interesting stuff was more of the independent stuff, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre or the international stuff, Jallo in Italy, and stuff like that. So I think there was an appetite for horror, right? Horror movie fans were starving for horror. So when uh, it explodes in the 80s, and all of a sudden studios see that, well, we don't have to put a lot of money into this, and you don't need, because the perception by the studios in the 70s, I think, was that you needed a star to make your horror valid, right? You needed Gregory Peck in The Omen. You needed somebody with some gravitas. That's why we have Donald Pleasance in Halloween, because you need, it's usually a British actor of some renowned, to give it, to make the audience uh, send the general audience the message that this, this is a movie worth watching. It's not one of those B-grade horror movies. But in the 80s, right, we have Halloween take off, and then Friday the 13th tries to copy the formula, and that takes off, and you get these copies, and these copies of these copies, and you get all this horror movies. And I think the studios, because they do this all the time, they learn the wrong lessons. So they think, all we need is our Freddy, our Jason. You just need the slasher, the star, and some teenagers to kill. And that's it. And so one girl that makes it to the end. And one girl that makes it to the end. <laughs> right? And then, so they just, they follow that formula for all of the 80s. And horror fans who have been hungry for anything, nobody's paying attention to them. All of a sudden, they're getting everything. All the horror, right? Horror explodes in the 80s. 
that coincide with VHS, VCRs. So now you can watch horror at home, but not only can you watch it at home, you can watch it at home and see the stuff that they don't air on TV. So it explodes like that, and there's another revenue st stream now, right? Because you can make a $2 million horror movie, it can make 15 to $20 million at the box office, and then it makes more money in video store rentals. So I think that's part of the reason that the quality in some of these drop off because the studios don't really care anymore. They just need the star and the franchise, the franchise name and the star, which is why uh, horror movie fans were really upset in Halloween 3 <laughs> when there's no Michael Myers. So they have to say in the titles of 4, 5, and 6, Michael returns, revenge of Michael Myers, to tell you, Michael's in this one, don't worry. <laughs> we're not gonna do that again. But I think what's hap what happens is that the product gets watered down, right? Because the number of horror movies being made in the 80s explodes and it goes up and up and up and up. And then general audiences who aren't horror fans begin to catch on and be like, hey, wait a minute. They're, they're not doing anything new. They're just giving us the same thing over and over again. So they cash out. And then eventually your horror fans start to pay attention. But I think what, so what happens when Scream comes out is horror is at the lowest point. When Scream comes out, the number of uh, movies, percentage of movies that's being produced that are horror movies is at the lowest point it's been in since prior to the 80s boom, it's like 2% of all movies, which means we're getting 400 movies a year, which is, what is the math on that? Like eight horror movies a year? Um, anyways. Uh, so I think what really killed horror though was the Silence of the Lambs. What? <laughs> I love Silence of the Lambs. I do too, but here's what I think. This is just my... I think what happens, because after The Silence of the Lambs is when production of horror movies stops again, and I think it's because studios learned the wrong lesson again. The Silence of the Lambs comes out, it comes out, I think, in like February of the year, makes a whole bunch of money, stays in the awards conversation all year, and it wins the big five. It wins Best Picture, Best Director, Best Actress, Best Actor, and Best Screenplay. It's only, I think, at that point, the third film in Academy Awards history to do that. I think what happens is studios go, oh, we can return to the prestige. So the horror movies that are getting made after that are your uh, period piece costume, high art uh, horror films like Interview with a Vampire, Bram Stoker's Dracula, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Still good. Yeah, all good, <laughs> but all different, and we're only getting so many of them now because now studios are saying, hey, Francis Ford Coppola, <laughs> you want to come make a movie? <clears throat> so they're spending money on the films again, but they're making less of them because it's horror. So you can't make uh, 16 $2 million horror movies. We're just going to make two $20 million horror movies. But those type of like horror movies, they weren't really like a psycho killer coming after you s try to scare you. They were more of like a a full length like thriller, maybe like right a dramatic, dramatic thriller aspect and instead of actual that. horror. I love Bram Stoker's Stoker Dragon. It's my oh, yeah. See movie. no, but see that's the thing. See because Silence of the Lambs is a success. And it wins audiences like Michael. But I wouldn't so even consider Silence of the Horror. See, yeah, I, until just recently, when I heard someone call Silence of the Lambs a horror movie, I was like, what? That's a horror movie. But I can see how people would consider it a horror movie. It depends on how broad you generalize everything, right? Like, if you're going to generalize horror movies as into it, it might be slightly scarier outside of norm. And then you go back to the original... 
slasher kind of horror movie style of that and then how, the differentiation that comes through that of evolution that you're, you're talking about it's kind of like even within that what is horror and how do you define it to be that core group but piece like, of it or should scare you in some way like in the 70s with like the exorcist and the omen it's all based around religion and people were super religious back then so that scared the shit out of them yeah. because they thought all of this was real but that's why that's all the only thing being made in the 70s yeah. because rosemary's baby in 68 is the same thing it's religious it's supernatural horror so studios are like oh everything has to be this that's why we get the omen and the exorcist where it's religious supernatural horror but if until you watch Halloween the... comes and it breaks the mold and it's yeah. just a guy in a nut with a knife in any street could be breaking into your house, stabbing you. But I think that's where we get, uh, right, because of the 80s, the proliferation of horror the, uh, and the slasher, that horror gets conflated with slasher. So which is why you have the conversation of, well, this isn't, Jaws isn't horror, but I mean, horror could be anything that scares someone. If it makes you not want to go in the ocean, mm -hmm. it's horror. If it makes like you go want to shower, it's horror. If it makes you not want to talk to a cannibal, <laughs> it's horror. <laughs> uh, afraid of your psychiatrist? Scared of lotion? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> scared of lotion. <laughs> Um, yeah, so which I think is why Scream is so important because although there's some horror fans who might not be a fan of Scream or a fan of sort of what the, the wrong lessons, again, that studios learn from the success of Scream that everything has to be jokey aimed at teens and get youth, but it kicks off again this rise of the number of horror movies being made and that still hasn't stopped it's still getting more and more and more every year or horror audiences are growing and i think which uh another reason scream is still relevant is because it can keep coming back and be like oh, okay now we're going to comment on torture porn but I don't know. Maybe yeah. that's just my view. <laughs> you could take that and look at the Scream and then look at the Scream franchise as it goes and it would follow that same base model that you're talking about, right? Like it's... Well, even in Scream, they make fun of it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, I don't know. It's funny because, so, um, yeah, so Scream comes out, it's a success, and then they do Scream 2, but Scream 2, what happens is the script is leaked, so they have to do last-minute rewrites and abandon their original plans. So I, I think, to me, Scream 2 isn't as strong. No. And then, by the time Scream 3 comes out, uh, Kevin Williamson is busy making Dawson's Creek, so he can't write it. So somebody else comes in to write it, using originally his original story outline, but then, as we mentioned earlier, uh, Columbine happens. And that, that they have to abort their plans. So originally, Scream 3 was going to be more like Scream 4. It was going to have a stab fan club of teenagers targeting Sydney. Columbine happened. The studio wasn't happy with uh, making a movie about high school kids killing people. So they, let's go to Hollywood, right? <laughs> so that's why Scream 3 is completely different because it's, they're trying to do something different, and it's a completely different writer. And then Williamson comes back for Scream 4, which is my second favorite Scream. Because really? we, yeah. <laughs> What's your second favorite Scream? None. None. <laughs> you don't like <laughs> Scream and that's Just it. Because anything after that is so predictable and watered down. And it was just like, dude, you just made this movie because the first one was popular. <laughs> That's just it. You build I, a I franchise saying, and you I keep got going. I really excited for, for Scream for the first time in the newest one. Because we've got that, uh, the, the open and the opening kill. And he kills her in the alleyway. And none of that is anything that new. 
But then he takes off the mask, and we're seeing him walk around. I'm like, are we going to have a Scream movie where we know who one of the killers is? I was like, they're going to do something new. And then but they, they did it. But they did. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I was all excited because like, my daughter's like, yeah, the new one's way better. I watched, no. No, it was just as predictable as the other ones. It kind of goes to how far you bring a franchise on either way, right? Like back in the day, you'd hit two, maybe three movies, where now you're hitting four or five, six, well, seven, eight. Back in the day, because there's dudes. so many Jasons, so many Fridays. Yeah, I mean, but that even keeps going. Really Those are the long time. Eight Jasons, six Halloweens. But at what point did the Jasons... Nightmare on Elm Street? And then you get like the Freddy versus Jason, <laughs> which, even though it's corny, I love that movie. So those are the ones that lasted the test of time, though, that made it through. When you like, really back in the day, like I keep thinking, like e- the original Evil Dead, and now to Army of Darkness. You hit three, you've got a franchise. Holy cow! But when you're talking about how things, and even to the ones you're talking about, uh, they go to six, seven, eight, and you look at now with all the movies that get up to eight, nine, ten into the franchise aspect of it. Is this a part where the actual core story and what you like, you can only do it so many times. You got to keep the bridge back to the source, but. Well, I think you've done it 10 too, times it, like in most of the franchises is you have a different director and a different writer in every single one of them. And then um, you have studios um, chickening out because originally uh, the ending of Scream 4 was supposed to be a cliffhanger ending. It was supposed to be uh, Jill stabbing Sydney and then the movie ends and you don't know if Sydney survives, and then they were the Ken Williamson's original plan would be Scream Five would start with Sydney having amnesia, not remembering that Jill was the killer, thinking, believing the story that Jill told that it was her boyfriend, and it would be Jill versus Sydney. So you'd have our hero and our anti-hero, but studios backed out of that. They were afraid of that. I think for most of it, too, is people fall in love with the character, like the killer, so Jason. So people are going to watch this movie regardless, knowing that they know the recipe and they know how it's going to end, just because they love the character. Same thing with Freddy's and Ghostface. Yeah. I don't think they really care. I think they like the... Well, yeah, like if in Halloween, it's been teased like three times now that... X character is going to continue on the mantle of Michael Myers. Michael Myers is dead, and it's Jamie Lloyd in Scream 4. And the Scream 4, she kills her stepmom or, or foster mom, right? And it's like, Jamie Lloyd is going to be the new Michael Myers. And then Scream 5 starts, and nope, she's running away from Michael Myers. And then they do the same thing in uh, the Rob Zombie Halloween, Halloween 2, right? It ends with... Lori is going to be the new Michael Myers, but we don't get any more of that. And then the newest Halloween again has that character who is teased to be, right? He's the killer for most of the movie in Halloween ends, right? But nope. So they, they, yeah, they propose good ideas, interesting ideas. There's no follow through. No. And I, and it's, uh, reactionary, right? Like they kill uh, Dewey in Scream Five. People were upset, understandably. So what happens in Scream Six? Nobody dies. People get stabbed multiple, multiple, multiple times, <sighs> and at the movie they're like, "Oh yeah, I'm good." <laughs> that's one thing I hated about that one. Yeah, I mean, and that's uh, the. Part of that was cool. It's like, there's two ghost faces at the same time stabbing someone and they both do the knife wipe. I'm like, cool. <laughs> and then the guy at the end of the film, Michael, is like, hey, still alive. Oh, Dewey. No, no. not Dewey. Well, Dewey gets stabbed in every movie until, yeah. until he dies. He gets all messed up. Yeah. It's <laughs> funny because you get stabbed. You know, I'd be like I'd be like, you know, this maybe this isn't the town for me and I, I think that would move. <laughs> at the at the end of the scream, do we get stabbed in the back? Right. And then he has a limp for some reason in Scream Two. Yeah. Which they point out, be like, I thought you were stabbed in the back. It's like severed a nerve, okay. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, where was I going to go with this next? I'm so, very excited to find out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I think maybe I might have some agreement from you. I think the most, the strongest, most consistent horror franchises, two come to mind. One that Kevin sort of mentioned is the Evil Dead. Yeah. Even though Evil Dead 2 is pretty much Evil Dead 1 all over again, but fun. Better. Better. Yes. yes. Evil Dead 2 is heads and tails better than Evil Dead, even though Evil Dead is good. And then Army Darkness, we take it somewhere else. Literally. <laughs> Literally. Yeah. Do you like the the remake and then the the Evil Dead Rise? Of the new ones? Yeah. Okay, so <laughs> the Evil Dead, the one that came out a few years ago, that one, I was impressed, and I was really excited. And we actually saw him at the theater, and he was getting mad through the whole thing. <laughs> um, I watched about 2% of that movie and saw the inside of my shirt for the yeah. rest of it. Um, I really enjoyed it up until the ending. The ending felt like, they ran out of time, and they were just like, eh, we'll just do this, which is very disappointing. It's like, you getting me there, then you're just like, no. It's probably studio notes. They're yeah, probably like, it, yeah, no, we have to do this instead. Yeah, and then she loses her arm <laughs> because a Jeep fell on it. And I'm like, oh, no. What about Evil Dead Rise? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, it has a great title card. Yeah, it does. And the previews were amazing. And I love that there was references and callbacks to the whole movie, even to the original Evil Deads. Right. That I loved. And I loved, like, the eyeball flying out and doing the recall from the first, first one. one. Yeah. 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 I caught all their little Easter eggs. And that's what the only thing that I liked about that movie. All right. The second franchise, I think, is the strongest. Uh, I think partly the reason that it's the strongest. So I, I propose Evil Dead because at least one, two, and three is Sam Raimi all the way. And it's Bruce Campbell. How can you go wrong with Bruce Campbell? He's amazing. Uh, but the other one, I think, is because it's uh, mostly from the same creative team is Child's Play. Yeah. Child's In fact, good. I will say that maybe Child's Play series gets better as it goes. It does, yes. Because it changes, but it, it, it changes with the times, and Chucky changes with the times himself. And they don't forget where they came from. Right. I, lo I love when a movie, just like the Chucky series right now, they do callbacks from like the first movie and bringing Andy in. I love when they do that because it's like, okay, you know that your fans have been watching this, and I hate when a movie pretends that only that movie exists right and there's not a whole chain of movies prior to that <laughs> so i really do even though i had very little expectations about this new chucky series and where chucky kept going but i love it it's so good it's like corny cheesy but i love how they reference everything and don't pretend that nothing ever existed prior to this. Right. You like Child's Play, Michael? No, I was thinking about about when you were saying franchises. Yeah. So when I was younger, let's, I'm gonna, this is going to make me sound pretty old. <laughs> he's, uh, he's, and he reminded me when you were talking about your uncle, is I would, I would be able to watch, you know, uh, late on Saturday night. Um <clears throat> Bella Lugosi, Boris Karloff, or uh, Lon Chaney in the old black and white, the old black and white monster movies. Right. And when I was a kid, I mean, they're not scary now. Right. But, but as a kid, they were really scary. Right. Even for the time, they were scary. I mean, Brian yeah. Frankenstein's pretty great. They, what about this new uh, weekend? At, what's that? It's a... It's a restaurant. Some guy's hanging out at Friday, Fridays, Fridays. Uh, uh, oh, I saw it on Five that. Nights at Freddy's. Yeah, Freddy. So that's now, that's like a Chuck E. Cheese. has bled <laughs> into video games. Video games. Oh. 
But it was like that before, like Resident Evil. Resident Evil and Silent Resident Hill. Evil helps revive the zombie genre, partly. I was going to ask earlier, actually, how many horror-themed tattoos do you have? Do you know? <laughs> I have a lot. My whole back is horror-themed. Um, I have Pennywise, the girl from Evil Dead. I have Samara from The Ring, Gage from Pet Cemetery. I have the female vampire from 30 Days of Night. And then I have a Buffalo Bill Cupid on my leg. I have a Texas Chainsaw rat. I have a Jason rat. Oh no, I have red <laughs> rum tattooed across the back of my legs. Now you're making me think of where all my horror ones are. I'm literally covered in them. Yeah, I was surprised actually <laughs> when you posted, Kevin, the, the pumpkin tattoo you got. I was surprised you had any space for a tattoo still. I got plenty of space Respect. compared to her. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm covered in tattoos. Michael, how many horror tattoos do you have? A zero. Zero. <laughs> zero. Like you get a tattoo every time you go on vacation, right? Yeah. That you're too. going to Egypt? Yeah. So you're going to get Boris Karloff's mummy tattooed on you, or, right? Or, or an onk. Yeah, maybe an onk. I, maybe a maybe a scarab. Do you know Boris Karlov's birth date? No. William Henry Pratt. That's less cool. Boris, because <laughs> <laughs> he's British. Yeah. He's just a yeah. pasty British guy. Yeah, Boris is is definitely Karlov is definitely better sounding. Like my last one wasn't very horror like it was. It was Donald Duck. Donald Duck nice. looking angry. Well, if you're afraid, of, angry if you're duck. afraid of ducks, <laughs> ducks that talk, or people who can't talk properly, <laughs> <laughs> maybe. <laughs> okay, before uh, we finish, I'm gonna make. Uh, I'm gonna say why I like Scream so much. I like Scream uh, because, well, it's fun, but because I think it's so smart. Uh, Michael, because every scene we go through, we introduce a character, we give a little bit of backstory, and every time we introduce a character, we give them a viable reason that that person could be the killer, right? There's, I think maybe Tatum is the only killer or the only character that they don't really give a moment and be like, this person is the killer because this reason. But Tatum played like the slut that dies. The slut that dies. You don't like the slut that dies? No, but like in every movie, there's like the slut that dies right away. Right. And then there's like the good girl, which would be Nev Campbell's character. Right. So it's just playing against like the, the recipe of horror. Well, it's like don't have sex or you'll die. <laughs> I suppose. there There is the moment, though, that I like when... Uh, when they have the sleepover, and the one thing the one thing that bothers me about that scene is they're in Tatum's bedroom. She's got two single beds for some reason. I always wondered that too. Yeah, but she's in like she's dressed like a little girl, and she's got her stuffed animal and everything. And that just to me, um, like I read it, is like okay, she's really just a little girl and everything else outside of the bedroom is a show, right? She's putting on... No, is it that or just presenting her as the virgin? I don't know. Because <laughs> having it like that, like, even if you take it from the 80s movies, you would always have, like, the good virgin girl right. that usually made it to the end of the movie. Right. And then you would have her friend that was either a slut or... The bad girl. Right. That was usually the one, first one to die. That's true. But we only have two females die in Scream. Yeah. It's all mostly guys. But does it follow the same It does kind of follow the same platform, though. Because then you ask, like, what could be messaging behind it? And you take it back to the 80s, and it's basically... 
yeah, so don't do you, this or this will happen. You want to be this person so you can survive these yeah. things. So then you go to the scream and then you can just be like, well, all the guys are just filler. <laughs> we had a cut, we had an hour to fill. The girl that runs upstairs. Yes. See? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You got to be the dog girl that runs upstairs. I just love that she says that and then she ends up running yeah. Yeah. upstairs anyways. <laughs> but they do make fun of a lot of like, even Wes Craven's movies. I was like, he could be the dumb girl that runs up the stairs and. The, um, even the recipe that Wes Craven did, even with um, Freddy Krueger, like the Nightmare on Elm Street, they're all in the same thing. Like you have the group of kids, they all die, maybe two or three live, well, two or three usually live till the end. And then they all make fun of it and scream. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. There is a certain formula, like, I've noticed that it's usually a group of five friends. It's five friends in the original Evil Dead that go to the cabin. We've got our five friends in Scream. And what other horror movie was I watching usually it's the two couples five. and a side character. Right. Yeah. But I, I also like it because you can you can rewatch Scream. You can know who does what. I rewatched it again last night and I still noticed things that I had noticed but what I love is uh, if you just watch the looks that Billy and Stu shoot each other and the way that you could interpret it if the first time you watch it it'd be like dude not in front of my girlfriend stop talking about murder in front of my girlfriend but when you know the twist it's stop being so forthright that we just gutted somebody <laughs> And especially there's the part where um, where uh, Billy shows up to the house party towards the end and he comes in and uh, Stu offers them the bedroom to use upstairs. But the language that they're using before that, uh, Billy says something to him, don't be, or what does he say? He says something about not being so obvious. And you can read it as not being so obvious of what we're going upstairs to do. But I think it's more because when he shows up to the door, he gives him a look. And it's it's right after Billy yeah. kills Tatum, right? So it's like, yep, that's taken care of. And I like that for once we've got uh, a killer and a slasher that can be kicked and knocked down and covered in beer you know, he's not an inhuman thing. It's just a lanky teenager in a costume. I like that uh, it makes sense of you could go through the logic of where everybody is at all times and it, it makes sense. Yeah. Right? There's no, you're not like, like for the opening kill, when you don't know it's two killers, right? It's like, he was just in the house. How does he get, get her already? It's that typical horror movie thing. And then when you know, it's like, oh, there's two of them. That's how. There's two of them. Yeah, that's how they could get around so quickly. Yeah. Did you know that um, originally in Scream 3, um, why can't I think of Stu's name? Uh, Matthew Lillard was supposed to be in it. Uh, yeah, because he didn't dive from the screen first one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the original plan was have uh, Stu from prison was pulling the strings of the stab club targeting Sydney. Hey, if they could bring back Billy, how could they not bring back Stu? <laughs> Billy being back is, is, is really dumb. Do you know, uh, Kevin, what Stu Lily is? No clue. So Stu Lily is... Uh, uh, the fans, and it's Kevin Williamson has confirmed it. The fans' belief that Stu and Billy were in a romantic relationship. <laughs> yeah, they were secret lovers. They were secret lovers. And you could read, right? Because they kill each other's girlfriends or ex girlfriends, right? Mm hmm. But uh, that was, William says that, Williamson says that was inspired by Leopold and Loeb. Do you know who Leopold and Loeb are, Michael? No. Uh, they were two in 1924, two uh, very intelligent uh, men. I think they were 20 and 19. Uh, 
and they had a belief that um, their superior intellect uh, meant that they had superior morality. Now, playing into that is the fact that Leopold and Loeb were gay, so they're being told that that's morally wrong, right? But they know that's not morally wrong. They're smarter than that. So then they think, well, if that's people are wrong about that morally, maybe they're wrong about other things. So they devise a plan to, uh, to commit murder and get away with it because they have the right to, because uh, they have higher intellect, which means they have a higher level of morality. Uh, so they they end up uh, picking up a 14-year-old boy, murdering him, dumping his body. The idea was that they were going to hold him for hold him for ransom, even though he was dead, uh, just to get away with it, just so because they could. I think they didn't. But they didn't. They were from very affluent uh, families. Uh, one of them, their father was, I think, the vice president of Sears Roebuck. The other one, his father owned uh, paper companies and was in shipping and mining. Um, but uh, one of them left their very unique prescription glasses at the crime scene, and they were caught. So they were not smart enough to get away with it. Uh, but yeah, so that is the inspiration for Billy and Stu. They're also the inspiration, have you seen Rope? Hitchcock's Rope? No, 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 no. no. Okay, no. So there's, uh, Rope is basically that setup. There's two characters who kill someone and then invite everybody over to a dinner party while the body is in the middle of the dinner party just because they get the kicks out of it and just so that they can uh, they kill him just so they can get away with it and feel superior to everybody so that scene in rocky horror picture show is that a is that a nod to maybe oh maybe maybe <laughs> are you a fan of rocky horror picture show kevin oh yeah that one I'll watch. That one I'll watch. <laughs> yeah, it's not. Well, it's I'm not as crazy of a fan as Kelly is, but I will watch it. That one I won't turn turn away. Leopold and Loeb are also inspiration for. Have you seen either of the Funny Games? There's more than one now. I've only seen the first one. That so there's uh the uh, I think is it Danish. There's an international version. And then the same director made the American version. Oh, okay. So he remade his own film. Um, and then there's also Murder by Numbers. I don't know if you've seen, seen that one. Have you seen Murder by Numbers? Dude. <laughs> <laughs> I know I've watched it with mom, so she's seen it. Uh, but it's funny because in the American version of Funny Games, one of the two killers is played by Michael Pitt. In Murder by Numbers, one of the two killers is played by Michael Pitt. So he has a lane to stay in, apparently. Uh, the other one is Ryan Gosling, is the other killer in Murder by Numbers. Maybe they have seen it. This was a while ago. It's wasn't Sandra it? Bullock. Uh, it's 2002, it came oh, out. Okay. Then I probably have seen it. You probably have seen it. Anything else? Anyone want to say anything else about Scream or horror movies? Ah, I could talk forever. <laughs> so, uh, am I wrong in saying that part of the reason that the Child's Play franchise gets better is because it gets gayer? Because it gets gayer? Yeah, it gets more queer. I think there's always like not in horror movies about gay. It's just them being out in the open about it. Whereas, like you said before, it just follows with the times, yeah. right? Like the world of society today is a lot more open than it was well, like 30, in, 40 years ago. Into the vampire. <laughs> was that in, like in, um, oh, what's his name? Yeah, I can't think of his name right now either. Louis? Louis. Was that and Louis? Yeah, Louis. You're telling me yeah. they were very... <laughs> Very gay. Well, they're outright gay in the in the, in the series, series yes. are they? Yeah. But even in the books, they were very homoerotic. 
the books are very homoerotic with that. So yeah. it's like, I can understand the early 90s, maybe like not being so out about it. Right. But it was still there. It was all through the movie, which makes the movie amazing. <laughs> <laughs> And how they fight and bicker with each other. Yeah, they're just a couple. They're just a old they're, couple. They're just an old gay couple. Yeah. There, I think there needs to be, I mean, there, we've had uh, like touches of it. John Waters has done versions, multiple maniacs and things like that. But I think it's about time that we just have a full on big budget horror movie where everyone is a drag queen. Yes. I want, I want the victims. Mm -hmm drag queens i want the killer a drag queen but would you consider leatherface a drag queen <laughs> he uh, he does wear the apron he and does, he does cross dress yes he wears some makeup especially he, in the next generation that's all he wears is women's clothing and makeup in that one and that's the one with matthew mcconaughey in it have you yeah, seen it yeah 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 but does that is that all it takes to be a drag queen though i don't know but he is kind of He's kind of based like Buffalo Bill's character. Right. But would you consider Buffalo Bill kind of drag queen? No, I think Buffalo Bill is maybe a 90s version of transgender, but done in the 90s way. To kind of scare people. Yeah. And it's... thinking that like, this is whatever. He... Yeah. Yeah. Because, uh, what is his name? I fa I'm failing to, the director of... It's Jonathan Demi, director of Silence of the Lambs after that, because some of the, he upset some people with that character, oh, which yeah. is why he makes Philadelphia after that. He tries to atone which to that the gay community. Also upset a lot of people. Yes, it is, <laughs> but it's the night is yeah, I mean I don't know. If that can that be used as an excuse though? That, that it was the nineties? That's the times. <clears throat> If you put movies in, if you put movies into, and and actually people's thought process too, I think I wouldn't say it's an excuse. I would say it is what it is, but that doesn't make it right for today. Yeah. All right. Like in the time, I'm gonna t like I'll be honest with you. When I in the '80s, so I was growing up in the '80s. I was a teenager in the '80s, and I was homophobic as could be. All right. And I said to a buddy of mine, I said, you know, uh, who, who would have thought, uh, you know, when we were younger that I would be writing on the back of the Theater Northwest band handing out water at a pride parade? I would have never in a million years thought, thought that I would be doing that. People change, times change. So if you put it in, into context with the times, I think it just is what it is based on that time. And I, I don't know that it's it's, it's wrong. It's like the stones and brown sugar, right? They're not going to do it now. They're not going to play the tune. They did it back in the, in 70, 60, 70, 71. 71. So it, it is what it is at that time. It's still a good song. Is it, is it politically correct? No. Would they play it now? No, they don't play it live anymore. So, you know, does it make it, does it make it bad, a bad movie or a, you know, bad piece of art? No, I don't think so. Yeah, I don't know if... But they could, I don't think you can use it as, as that, as one single excuse. No. No. I think it's, like, appreciate the past and what people have gone through, but learn from it and move on from it. Mm -hmm. Don't pretend that the past never existed or you're just going to repeat yourself over and over exactly. again. Sounds like the same thing you were saying about franchises. Kind of, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but like uh, you mentioned John Waters. Yeah. He had Divine in his show, his movie. Right. And that was a pretty popular drag queen at the time. Yeah. I mean, but John Waters didn't have sort of the, the reach and the budget, right, that he would later get without Divine, unfortunately. Yeah. But, yeah, uh, anyways, that's that's my demands, is I want a full-on, I want a very, 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 because I think movies are gay. <laughs> movies are gay. They're dramatic. They're theatrical. They're costumed. 
it, that it's putting on a false face, pretending to be somebody else. Movies are gay. <laughs> now for your uh, <laughs> drag queen slasher, I'd have to say John Waters would have to direct it. Direct it? Yeah. Or he can just be in it. Both. Like Both. when he was in Chucky? Yeah. Not many people knew that. Yeah. Tom Waters is in Chucky. <laughs> cool. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. I'll take your word for it. Yeah. That's, that's good. Uh, I think uh, any any last words? Anything else? Thanks for having me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks for coming. Talking horror. Um, yeah, next time we do another horror movie, bring you guys back. I think I'll give Michael and everybody else a, a break for a little while, though. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we'll wrap things up. Uh, this podcast was recorded in the Arts North Podcast Studio in Studio 2880. I will once again thank my guests, Kevin and Kelly Gunderson, for coming out, and Michael Cast. Uh, stay tuned for more, and be sure to check out On the Marquee on YouTube. <laughs>